Congressman, 939 days since the attack on the Capitol now. He's former president is facing charges for his attempts to cling on to power, not to incite the riot that day, but to actually use violence in a number of instances, not just on January 6th, to, along with his co-conspirators, try to advance his scheme or conspiracy, the alleged conspiracies, uh, in seven states and other places to try to hold on to power, even though they say he knew that he had lost the election. How, what are your reflections on this moment? Well, you know, of course, I was there on January 6th, and you'll remember that the president, uh, President Trump, uh, shortly after January 6th, uh, said publicly that he had done everything, in his words, totally appropriate. Uh, that was the defining moment for me when I knew that I needed to vote to impeach him. But, you know, we saw it here in Michigan. Uh, they had fake electors uh, that— they, cr they tried to confuse the issue to, to send them uh, to the vice president uh, to count. We saw a number of other states that, that followed that same road. Uh, you know, it's not first. Uh, it's not the First Amendment uh, that we're talking about here. It's the actual conspiracy where he actually tried to change the outcome of the counting of the election from the electors on January 6th. Mike Pence did the right job. It's a ceremonial job. Uh, but the evidence, and I read through the indictment, I'm not a lawyer, but it's all right there in, in a number of states in terms of what he was plotting to do, more, far more than just, I'm sorry, uh, I won, sort of the big lie. Uh, they really did have a conspiracy to, to, to stop the counting of the vote and, and deny Joe Biden his rightful place as the president of the United States. Congressman Ana Cabrera here. Many of your former colleagues feared for their lives on January 6th. Yeah. And, and even too. after I, you and them, exactly. And you came out, you literally stuck your nut, neck out there politically. And, and yet we're not seeing a lot of that amongst your colleagues, even after this indictment, they are still backing the former president. What's your message to them today? Well, it's not only to my former colleagues, but it's also those within the the White House uh, circle itself. I mean, I watched Bill Barr last night. Of course, I read his book a year or two when, when, it, when it came out. Uh, you know, you, I read that there are some 40 members, I guess, of his former cabinet uh, majority, a far majority of those are saying that he's, he's not fit to serve. Those are my words. That's not, not exactly the way that the question was, was answered. But who are they? <laughs> Their names, other than a couple of them, haven't really come forward. They're still hiding uh, behind what they saw firsthand. And, you know, it's let's face it, people are scared of a primary. You know, I look at my own Michigan congressional Republican delegation, and I'm good friends with all of them. But, you know, it was about two weeks ago that after a couple of these indictments now, they came out and endorsed them uh, in the primary. I saw earlier this week a number of former colleagues in Ohio uh, came out and endorsed them. You, uh, you, you look at Florida, where you'd think, you'd think that uh, Governor DeSantis would have a, a, a good grip in terms of his own congressional delegation. Uh, all but two or three have endorsed uh, Trump. They're scared to death of a primary and that grassroots uh, that may defeat them. And until they get to the filing deadline, which, guess what, isn't until mid-next year for a number of states, Michigan, I think it's in April of next year, they don't want to. They don't want to poke the bear. Uh, they don't. They they simply don't want to have the prospect of, of losing a primary. And frankly, from the Republican perspective, uh, in terms of the overall majority, maybe even lose the House if you have some of these other folks uh, actually beat them. So it's it's it's. I understand that how difficult the situation is, but you know, at some point you got to have a compass. You got to look where that arrow is going and, and decide that. The Constitution uh, plays a little bit larger role than politics. Congressman Chris Chansing here. If you believe, though, the, the, the polls, Donald Trump doesn't even have a challenger. Everyone else is so far yeah. behind. The latest poll yeah. has him in a hypothetical matchup against Joe Biden, absolutely tied. I want to get your take on something that Catherine Miller wrote in The New York Times, quote, nobody outside his supporters wants to talk about the eventuality not probable, but definitely not impossible that Donald Trump will be reelected. 
His former cabinet, cabinet secretaries don't. The people, the foreign ministers and former national security officials at the Aspen Security Forum don't. And the closer you get to presidential campaign events, elections can become a kind of dreamscape, a contained universe where meta attacks are signaled. Yet nothing seems that weird about Mr. Trump's dominance. Do you see any way for his opponents to challenge him in a way that sticks? You know, he's got a lot of Teflon. <laughs> his first name is Don. Uh, I always call him Mr. President. Uh, but, you know, with every indictment, he gets stronger. He's taking all the air uh, oxygen out of the balloon, and no one's got a chance. We've got, what, 12 people that are running against him. Uh, I am somehow I'm on, on uh, his email list. I get about, I've gotten five just in the last uh, 10 minutes. Email, I get about a do at least a dozen emails a day where he's just trouncing the opposition. I mean, he's up 50 points in Tennessee. You got a new poll down in New Hampshire. I got saw that today. He's up like 30 points there. Uh, he's got 100,000 Trump supporters in Iowa, and they, they're going to turn him out for their caucus uh, when they meet in January. I mean, it's a runaway uh, here in Michigan. I mean, it's the, the whole delegate congressional delegation is for him. Uh, it seems like the others don't have a prayer. Uh, they're almost all, almost all of them are in single digits, and he's at 47. You look at the national polls, and I got to say, Rasmussen has had Trump beating Biden since June. I mean, for the last two months. Now, I saw some polling numbers. I'm part of the No Labels organization uh, as a volunteer. Uh, we saw numbers the end of March, early April that, yes, Trump beats Biden one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So it's, it's not out in the picture at all that, that even with this indictment, maybe another one coming down in Georgia, that he doesn't continue to get stronger. I saw an email just in the last few minutes from Carrie Lake. Uh, she's demanding that all the other folks, uh, all the other Republicans that are running against him, drop out so that they can rally, circle the wagons. Uh, let, let's focus all of our efforts on making sure that uh, the Republicans take the White House and you know, at, at this point, because Trump has an almost insurmountable lead, it's time for you to surrender. Fred Upton, we do appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. It's a pleasure to have you on the program.